Hello, my name is Colin Stronach, Head of Funding Allocations in the Post-16 Funding Team at the Education Funding Agency. I'm going to talk to you today about the allocations process and timeline for 2015-16. I'm going to cover five main topics today. Firstly, I'm going to talk about the allocations timeline and data sources. So, what we are going to produce when and how we are using your data. Secondly, I'll move on to the funding formula for 2015-16 and particularly funding bands, that is whether students are full-time or part-time. Next, I'll say something about the processes for handling business cases and infrastructure changes. Fourthly, I'll talk about the approach to subcontracting. And finally, I'll say something about funding for student support. So, starting with the timeline for the allocations process. This first slide sets out the key dates between October and December. I'd like to highlight one specific item from this slide, the autumn funding letter. This is a letter from Peter Mucklow, the EFA Director for Young People, that sets out the main points relating to post-16 funding for the coming year. The letter was sent out in October and is available on our website. It is a key source of information for all institutions involved with post-16 funding. The other key elements on this part of the timeline relate to data returns made by institutions and to initial information we will be sending out to inform funding for 2015-16. I'll say a bit more about how we are using your data returns later in this session. The first part of the allocations timeline is very similar to the approach we've applied previously. This second part includes some more significant changes. The main change is that we're bringing the allocations process forward we are aiming to announce the national funding rate in January and send in allocations out to the majority of institutions by the end of February. We expect this to apply to all institutions except those FE institutions where allocations are based on RO6 data submitted in February. In those cases, allocations are likely to be sent out in early March. As in previous years, we will send out information on lagged student numbers and funding factors in December and January to give you early information on the values we expect to use to calculate your allocation. However, unlike in earlier years, we will not deal with business cases at that stage in the process, as there would not be sufficient time. Instead, we will handle all business cases in March and April once we've sent out the allocations in February. This change to the process means that the large majority of institutions who do not have data issues will have more certainty about their allocation earlier than in the past. Moving on now to the data we will use to calculate your allocations, starting with schools and academies. The main data that we use for your allocations is based on the autumn census. This gives us data for two different groups of students. Firstly, we will use the data you return in the census for students enrolled this year, 2014-15, as the basis for your lagged student numbers for next year. And secondly, we will use the data for those students enrolled last year, 2013-14, to determine the main funding factors, size of programme, cost weighting and so on, that we use to calculate your funding allocation. The one exception is the data used to calculate disadvantage block two. That is, the funding based on the numbers of students without a GCSE Grade C in English or Maths. In that case, we will use match data, which includes achievements at age 16, to determine the amount of additional funding that you are eligible for. For FE institutions then, the data sources are set out on this slide. In most cases, your lagged student numbers will be based on the ILR R04 return from December. We will then use data on in-year recruitment patterns from last year to give the expected number of students for the whole year. We will review the FE data received in RO4 against the RO6 return received in February. Where there is a significant increase or decrease in student numbers, we may then revise the allocation accordingly. In those cases, this may result in a short delay in the issuing of allocations for the institutions concerned. For these institutions, the allocation will be made in early March. As for schools, we will then use data from 2013-14 to determine the funding factors that we use to calculate your funding allocations. 
And again, as for schools, we will use match data to determine the amount of Block 2 disadvantage funding. There's one other thing to mention here. For commercial and charitable providers, we are currently reviewing the approach we use to calculate lag numbers now that we have a full year's data on the new formula. We will confirm the approach that we will use for these providers by the end of November. Next, special schools and special post-16 institutions. For special schools, we will calculate your allocations as we did in 2014-15, based on the number of places agreed with local authorities at £10,000 per place. This mirrors the approach adopted pre-16. For special post-16 institutions, the lagged student number will be the higher of the number of places agreed with local authorities and the number of students recorded in the ILR R04 return. Up to now, we've used average funding values to calculate funding factors for these institutions. As this is the third year of the new funding methodology, we will assess the data we've received in the ILR for 13-14. We will then confirm whether we will continue to use averages or instead we will base funding directly on each institution's data, as we do for colleges. I now want to give you a summary of how the funding formula will work in 2015-16. First of all, I want to emphasise that there is no significant change to the formula for 1516. In terms of the rate of funding, we are not yet able to confirm the national rate per student. That will take place in January when we've analysed the data on student numbers recruited this year. However, I can confirm that the Block 2 disadvantage rates for students without GCSEs in English and Maths will be unchanged. That is, £480 for full-time students and the equivalent rates for part-time students. As we have said previously, two elements of funding protection will no longer apply in 2015-16. The transitional protection from the changes made after the 2010 spending review and the protection introduced for 2014-15 for the reduction in funding for full-time 18-year-olds. However, formula protection funding is still available in 1516, and I'll say more about that in a few minutes. First though, I want to say something about funding bands, that is, whether students are regarded as full-time or part-time. As I mentioned earlier, the 2015-16 allocations will use data from 13-14 to determine funding bands. 13-14 was the first year of the new funding formula and of study programmes, so we expect that many institutions will have increased the size of their programmes accordingly. As a result, the interim measure where we funded students recorded in Band 4, 450 to 539 hours, as Band 5 will no longer apply. The only students funded in Band 5 will be those students on programmes of 540 hours or more who are aged 16 or 17, or aged 18 or over and have high needs. The resulting funding bands for 2015-16 are shown on this slide. All those aged 18 and over without high needs and who are on programmes of 450 hours or more are funded in Band 4. This includes those 18-year-olds on programmes of over 540 hours. In addition, any 16 or 17-year-olds with programmes of 450 to 539 hours are funded in that same band. As I said earlier, we cannot yet confirm the rates for the funding bands for 2015-16, but for reference, in 2014-15, the rate for Band 4 is £3,300, compared to a rate of £4,000 for Band 5. The part-time bands are also shown here, and those bands apply irrespective of the age of the student. Moving on now to Formula Protection Funding, or FPF. For 2015-16, FPF will be calculated in a similar way to 14 15 by comparing the funding per student back to your 13-14 allocation. This ensures that FPF works as intended, that is, to protect institutions for reductions in funding from the changes in the formula in that year. As was the case in 14-15, where formula funding has increased from 13-14, then FPF will reduce accordingly. When formula funding has decreased compared to 13-14, then FPF will remain at the same level as it was in that year.
The following slides show this through some examples. The first examples are where the funding formula is lower in 1415 than it was in 1314. The blue bars show the funding earned through the formula up to 1415, and the green bars show different possible funding levels in 1516. The red bars show the amount of formula protection funding per student in each case. In these examples, the base funding in 1213 before the new formula was introduced was 4,500 per student. The funding formula in 1314 gave 4,000 pounds, resulting in 500 pounds per student of formula protection funding. As you will see, in examples one and two, the earnings through the formula are the same or lower in 1516 than they were in 1314. And so formula protection funding remains at £500 per student. In example 3, the funding formula is higher in 1516 than in 1314. So formula protection funding has decreased to £200 per student. And in example 4, the funding formula has risen above the 1213 level, so there is no formula protection funding. This second set of examples show the position where the amount earned from the formula in 1415 was greater than in 1314. So FPF in that year decreased to £200. The examples here show that, although the funding levels in 1415 are different from those on the previous slide, the outcomes for the different scenarios in 1516 are the same. In each case, we are comparing back to 1314 as the baseline, so the crucial factor is how the amount of funding earned through the formula in 1516 compares to the equivalent amount in that baseline year. It's worth noting that in the first two examples here, the level of FPF in 1516 is the same as in 1314, that is £500 per student, which is higher than the amount received in 1415. In no case, though, would an institution receive more FPF per student than they did in 1314. These charts are also included in the October funding letter, so if you want to look at them in more detail in relation to your own situation, then you can do so there. Moving on now to business cases. As in past years, for most institutions we will use your own data to calculate your allocation but by exception we will consider business cases where there has been a major error in the data. For the first time this year, we are confirming in advance the thresholds that we will apply to business cases. For cases involving lagged student numbers, the threshold is the lower of 5% or 50 students. For cases involving the full-time part-time split or other funding factors, the lower of 5% of funding or £250,000. For other cases, we do not have a fixed threshold, and so we will review these individually. It is important to note that these thresholds purely determine whether we will consider a case or not. We will then decide whether to agree the case based on the evidence provided. To allow us to get allocations out earlier to the majority of institutions by the end of February, the window for business cases will be during March, with decisions made during April. I'm now going to talk about a couple of specific issues that will affect only a proportion of institutions. Firstly, new sixth forms. Ministers have decided that proposals from schools or academies for new sixth forms should only be considered if the institution has been assessed as good or outstanding by Ofsted. This will now form part of the criteria applied by local authorities and regional schools commissioners in their decision making. Once a sixth form has been approved, the numbers funded will follow a standard approach as the institution builds up its numbers. In year one, we will normally fund a new sixth form based on one third of its overall planned capacity. In year two, we will then fund that sixth form for twice the number actually recruited in year one. And then in year three, we will fund them based on the lagged approach. Our experience is that this standard approach matches the profile of recruitment for most new sixth forms. However, some plan to build up more quickly and others more slowly, so we will consider cases for a different profile on an exceptional basis. Secondly, subcontracting. We'll be producing a refresh of our subcontracting guidance by the end of the year, 
The overall approach remains that, as for 2014-15, any distance subcontracting should be by exception only. We will expect institutions and your governing bodies to assure yourselves that you are compliant with the controls guidance and our other funding guidance. In particular, if you are intending to deliver any distance subcontracting, you will need to have a clear rationale as to why that provision is exceptional and so should receive EFA funding. EFA will be monitoring the levels of subcontracting through data returns and will request sample checks by auditors to ensure that provision is compliant. Finally, a few words on student support. There are no major changes to student support funding allocations for 2015-16. The arrangements we introduced in 13-14 for vulnerable bursary funds will continue and institutions should continue to make claims to the learner support service for those students in the defined vulnerable groups. We will be updating the bursary guide for 15-16 to include key findings and best practice from the external evaluation exercise. Turning to free meals, this year is the first year of the new scheme to fund free meals in post-16 institutions and we are collecting data in the ILR on the numbers of students who are eligible and have claimed free meals. We intend to base the free meals allocations for 15-16 on the ILR data collected at R04, uplifted to a full year figure as appropriate. However, if we feel this first free meals data collection is not credible or is unreliable, we will revert to using the mapped administrative data for students claiming free meals at the age of 15, as we did for this year's allocations. Some of our student support schemes are managed via contract currently held by Capita. This contract expires in September 2015, and we are currently re-tendering for the contract. We will keep institutions informed about the outcomes of this exercise and any changes to administrative arrangements which might result. As part of this exercise, we've decided to remove the residential support scheme from the new contract and we'll manage this in-house at the EFA. The guidance for 15-16 will be published in the spring and will set out any changes in the administrative arrangements. Thank you for listening and I hope you have found this helpful. We are happy to respond to any queries you may have by email at our normal addresses.